Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays here. And today I am talking about an all-timer. I'm talking about a classic. And it is making its debut on 4K UHD from Kino Lorber. And that would be Night of the Hunter from 1955. Directed by the great Charles Lawton. His only film in the director's chair as a filmmaker, unfortunately. Um... I think can do in no small part to the fact that the film was not well received at the time it came out, which I think is fascinating and is the story that we hear over and over and over about cult films and the kinds of films that become cult films because they don't find an audience when they're initially released. But it is truly one of the gems of the 1950s and is seen now as, you know, just an outstanding artfully made fairy tale nightmare of a film. I think that's part of the reason it was so difficult at the time to market and the marketing. If you look at the posters and things like that, it just really doesn't seem to be conveying what the film is. And again, it's not an easy film to convey. Uh, It is, definitely complex and different than a lot of, you know, entertainment films of the 1950s. Um, It is based on a novel um, by Davis Grubb, screenplay by James Agee. And the novel, um, interestingly, well, let me just, let me just summarize it. And for people that don't know what the film is, uh, it stars, as you can see, Robert Mitchum, Shelley Winters, uh, Lillian Gish, and others, um, Peter Graves. And it's about basically a family that's sort of torn apart by a couple things. Uh, the mother is played by Shelley Winters, and her children, um, I'll have to look up the kids' names, I apologize. Uh, But they witness their father, played by Peter Graves, returning home, pursued by the cops, and he's stolen some money, about $10,000, and he gives it to the kids to hide, basically he hides it with the children, and it's not revealed where, and I won't talk about that, but then the young boy sees his father arrested, And he is then later hanged for it. But while he's in jail, he encounters a very unscrupulous fellow uh, played by Robert Mitchum, who is a faux preacher who has been apparently committing a string of serial murders wherein he uh, finds widows, marries them, kills them, and takes their money. And in this case, he's actually taken a car from one of them and is picked up for the theft of the car and put in jail. Nobody's found the bodies because he's apparently clever enough to hide them. But um, he ends up in jail in the same cell with Peter Graves. And somehow it comes out that Peter Graves has stolen this money and Mitchum's character is trying to get him to admit and tell where the money's hidden, even in his sleep, and there's a great confrontation scene. But so what happens is that um, the fake preacher uh, goes after the widow, Shelley Winters, and you know is trying to find a way to get to the kids so he can get them to tell him where the money is. He wants that money. Like, apparently, whatever money he's taken from other widows has not been enough. He needs this $10,000 as well. So, he becomes a terrifying menace for these children. And the movie is told mostly from their point of view, you know. And and that's one of the masterful things about it is it's, like I said, this sort of nightmare fairy tale. And, And the movie starts on a more realistic plain sort of except that Mitchum's character is always very heightened and I think it's an incredible and interesting performance because it's so heightened Um, I mean there are reactions in it where he gets particularly cartoonish 
you know, like I'm talking about like Kurt Russell at the end of Death Proof cartoonish. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Kurt Russell watched Night of the Hunter and was like, how can I bring up my my response at the end here? Because um, there's just moments where this big bully is injured and he cries out in such a way as to be comedic. His facial expressions are extra large. He obviously tells the famous story of love and hate. He has love and hate tattooed on his hands. Um which uh, Ernest Dickerson and Spike Lee were both fans of Night of the Hunter, and that's part of the way that um, that speech finds it, its way into Do the Right Thing, and that's covered in one of the features on this disc. But it's a great speech, and he sells it well. It's it's pretty notorious. Uh, but he's just creepy and somehow fools some of the adults, but the kids, several, these two kids in particular, see right through him, and he is angered by that, and... You know, he's just creepy. He's just the stalking menace through this film. And there's a lot of great shots um, of him in shadow. And, in fact, the cinematography is really fantastic. It's by Stanley Cortez, who worked with Orson Welles on Magnificent Ambersons and with Fritz Lang on, I think, Secret Beyond the Door. I want to say that's the movie um, that, uh, yeah, Secret Beyond the Door, which I can't remember if I've seen that film or not. Uh, but then he'd go on to work with Sam Fuller on Naked Kiss and Shock Corridor. And, you know, he's a really masterful cinematographer. He uses, a, I guess, like what you would call a high-contrast lighting uh, sort of style throughout. So we get some really heavy shadows. And he just really does a wonderful job of, you know, capturing and making this feel like more of a fairy tale than anything else or a nightmare. Uh, some of the sets are designed in a really cool way where... We see the out the basic outline of a room, uh, but then there's a lot of black around it. There's a couple scenes, like a bedroom scene and then a basement scene that are shot particularly this way that I think really add to that feeling of this otherworldly nature. In fact, the movie starts with sort of a floating, uh, almost face of Lillian Gish telling a story, and then we see floating heads of children. And so there's almost immediately a sense of, you know, something's not of this world or ethereal or something anyway it's a great story and a great performance by Mitchum and Lillian Gish is great she ends up sort of getting the kids they sort of find their way to her and she's it's as if I've heard it said it's as if Mitchum is playing some sort of personification of the big bad wolf and Lillian Gish is kind of like mother goose in a way and in that sense you know bigger and able to protect the kids surprisingly from this menace uh, because he's still going after them even after they've, you know, escaped, apparently. But Lillian Gish is really great in this. And um, so Lawton had never directed a feature before, and there's a lot of cool stuff that comes out. And I'm going to do a little quick comparison to the Night of the Hunter Criterion Blu-ray, which I will say right now, do not get rid of this because... There's some really outstanding features on this, and they are definitely not duplicated on this 4K. And um, this really, I hadn't really gone through the features on my Criterion until, you know, preparing for this. And I realized just how great that Blu ray is. Um, and not to say that this 4K is totally lacking, but it's there's some stuff on here that's really essential and amazing. Uh, but some things that come out, uh, I think the producer's name is Paul Gregory. And he talks about how he came to meet Lawton and find the novel and put it in front of Lawton. And eventually, I guess he was the one who he says he's the one who suggested that Lawton direct it. But one of the things I thought was neat is that he met him after I can't remember if it was like a TV appearance or something. And he just thought he was so eloquent that he ran down to this studio where he was filming. I may be, I'm paraphrasing this. I can't remember the exact details, but basically the idea is he met him in the alley and Lawton was like, talk to my agents. And he's like, you're throwing away a million dollars. And, and he's like, wait, what? And he's like, I have an idea. And basically I can't, I think Mitch, I think um, Lawton might've read a Bible verse on the air and uh, Paul Gregory saw it as a great opportunity for a touring one-man show, and this became a thing, and that's what he talked Lawton into doing. He talked him into doing a one-man show where he went and read Bible passages, and it doesn't sound necessarily like it'd be a big winner, but there's just something about 
Lawton and the way he speaks. He was obviously one of the great actors of the 1930s, but by this time, I think he had felt sort of passed by in a way in terms of his acting and, and hadn't considered directing. And so anyway, this was, I think, a boost to his ego and definitely made him some money and gave some trust between the producer and Lawton. And then I think they found their way to this material and they got a screenwriter to work on it. And it was made relatively cheaply, as I understand it. I've heard anywhere from 600000 <clears throat> to $800,000 in 1955, which sounds expensive, but really wasn't that bad um, at that time. But again, the film just was too odd, I think, or too arty for uh, UA, United Artists, at the time. And they just weren't able to promote it properly and I think it just failed and I think Lawton felt like a failure. There's some great stories that um, on the um, part of this Blu-ray there's a TV special like a 15 minute thing for the BBC where they talk to Mitchum and Lillian Gish and uh, the producer and some other people when they were still alive and it's a really great 15 minutes and one of the things Lillian Gish said that I thought was interesting was she said that they would sometimes offer ideas for scenes as actors collaboratively do with directors and that he, unfortunately, instead of taking it in the spirit of collaboration, read it more as like, oh no, you think I'm doing this scene wrong? And she's like, well, no, I just, you know, I thought maybe it could be a little better with this idea or this addition or whatever. And eventually, apparently, the actor's, were so, um, <clears throat> I guess they were just not, they just became not put off, but sort of nervous about the idea that they were making, <laughs> they were affecting his confidence by bringing up suggestions and in that way saying he wasn't doing the movie right. And so they began to stop doing that. But that said, it, it really underlines the idea that he was as great an actor as he was, he was incredibly underconfident in the filmmaking side of things. And so that's a bummer because he just seems like such an authoritative guy that you wouldn't believe that he could be. But, you know, an actor, I, I, I believe it's a very difficult profession and one where you're really putting yourself out there in a way that you're so vulnerable that I could understand how it would, you know, make for a certain mindset. Um, but anyway, that said... Uh, the film didn't do well, and I think that hurt Lawton deeply, and the, I think that affected why he never tried to direct another film, which is too bad. But that what we do have is one of the great films of the 1950s, so it's one of those things. I mean, I think he died in like 1962 or something, so I don't think he lived long enough, unfortunately, to see this film you know, really embraced and reappraised. I think it was brought into the um, uh, National Film Registry in 1992 or something like that. So obviously that's, you know, 30 years after his death. At that time, I feel like it was really finally getting some recognition as a classic, but it's taken a long time. And it's always sad to me when a movie that we now sort of universally recognize as great was not received well and thus the filmmaker was not uh couldn't have any moment of uh appreciation for the fact that his film is now beloved but that said great performances all around Shelley Winters is great uh the kids are great Gish is great Mitchum's great I really love the movie and I love the look of the movie there's just some incredibly stylized shots uh silhouetted shots uh one particular of the kids looking out I think a barn window and seeing uh, what is the silhouette of Mitchum on a horse riding and singing this creepy um, biblical song. One of the real, there's a, p a bunch of very memorable shots. There's one of, sh of uh, a character that's been killed underwater in a car. Uh, I won't give away who that is in case you haven't seen the film, but it's incredibly haunting. And once you see that image, it's seared onto your brain. You'll never, ever forget it. So it's really incredibly well put together. And again, I think Lawton, as underconfident as a filmmaker as he might have been, he was certainly confident in Stanley Cortez as a cinematographer and really relied on him and used him to great degrees to help create this incredible movie. 
Um, but okay. So the 4K. Um, this is a new HDR Dolby Vision Master from a 4K scan of the original 35 camera negative, and it does look really good. Um, the opening credits are a little soft for some reason. I don't, I, I don't know if it's the way that they were done or the color is maybe grayer than a white. And maybe that's why I'm expecting the white to pop. I don't know. But that said, the movie does look better than the Blu-ray from Criterion, which is only listed as a new restored digital transfer. It doesn't really say much about, um, that scan, but this new scan looks really nice. So if you're into the film, and you want it looking the best, this is definitely going to be worth your time. There's great detail here. There's even a comment made by um, Tim Lucas does the commentary, and I think that's a new track for this. I think that's a new track for this Blu-ray, but I, or this 4K, but I could be wrong. could have been part of a Blu-ray previous to this, but it's a very solid Tim Lucas track. At one point, there's a great shot of the kids looking out the window to the picket fence of the house they live in and Mitchum is standing out there under a light and Tim Lucas says he believes that it's Mitchum's stand-in but with the 4k and the clarity of the detail you can see I'm pretty sure it's actually Mitchum himself standing outside in this you know again one of the very memorable shots from the movie um so that's really interesting I found but um it also has an isolated music and effects track. The score is really effective and quite memorable and definitely really helps carry that notion of the nightmare fairy tale, you know, to a really wonderful degree. Um, included also are a few featurettes that I think are all new. Uh, and those are uh, Love and Hate, filmmaker Ernest Dickerson on Night of the Hunter. That's about eight and a half minutes. And again, he talks about his shared love of the film with Spike Lee and Do the Right Thing and how that got in there. Uh, he says it starts out realistic but enters a much darker, like, child's nightmare fairy, fairy tale stylistically akin to German expressionism, which I think is uh, apt and interesting that, um, you know, Stanley Cortez worked with Fritz Lang uh, and and he's, if not exactly part of that movement, certainly... Uh, could be aligned with that movement. Um, and he also talks a lot about the look of the film that Stanley Cortez used, as well as suggesting that, I guess, there's some scenes where Lawton was even suggested music by Cortez. Like, there's one story that comes up a couple times, Cortez tells it himself, where he was talking about a specific scene with Shelley Winters and uh, Mitchum, and he asked him, what's in your head right now? This is... Uh, Lawton saying to Cortez and he's like it's n no worries he's like no really I want to know and he's like well he, and he calls out this specific waltz and Lawton was so caught up with that idea and so approved of it that he actually got the composer to come down to the set and told him about it and they actually made the score a bit more waltz like in the scenes with Mitchum and Shelley Winters and I think that's interesting because I've almost never heard of a cinematographer cinematographer suggesting music and having uh the director take that suggestion but clearly he was such a trusted collaborator and was right those scenes work really well with that music uh anyway so it's a nice interview with Ernest Dickerson I'm a big fan of him go check out his trailers from hell he's really great in terms of the stuff he selects and he's really great filmmaker all around uh Little Lambs actress Kathy Garver on Night of the Hunter. This is about 10 minutes and it's the actress herself talking about her training as a kid actor and how she came to be cast in Night of the Hunter, which ended up being her first film and she recalls her experiences. I think she's one of the kids that Lillian Gish has with her that the brother and sister run into later. Um, and then there's also Hing Hang Hung artist Joe Coleman on Night of the Hunter, which is about almost 16 minutes. And Joe Coleman's a painter, performer, and discusses his work and how it aligns with Night of the Hunter. And he tells this great story of the Bluebeard of West Virginia something, Harry Powers, uh, this real, effectively, serial killer that the character of Mitchum's, his name's Harry Powell in the movie, seems to be based on. 
And he goes into his own thoughts on the film and some anecdotes about performances. But I was most taken with the idea of the true crime roots of the Harry Powell character and how this guy, I won't go into the details. I'll let you watch it for yourself. But the specifics of this guy's um, crimes uh, are unnerving. Um, And it's interesting when you align it with this character. It kind of makes it even more scary as a movie. But Mitchum is just so effective uh, in this role, despite the outsized nature of the performance. There are definitely moments of genuine fright for the children and what he will do to them. You just, you don't trust this guy at all. He's not above killing children. Um, anyway, so it's a it's a good disc. But like I said, I was sort of moved to check out my Criterion Blu-ray. And like I said, if you have this, Hold on to it. If you love this movie, you should probably get it. It's a two-disc set. Um, The first disc includes a commentary with film critic FX Feeney, archivist Robert Gitt, who will come up in a minute, Um, author Preston Neal Jones, and I want to... Oh, yeah, second unit director Terry uh, Sanders, who has a lot of great stories from the set. Um, You know, he shot second unit. He shot plates for Mitchum Driving. He shot helicopter shot from the, you know, he'll, he'll go into the details about what he did. And I I like, that's fascinating stuff. Um, then there are new documentary featuring interviews with Paul Gregory, the producer Sanders, Feeney Jones and author Jeffrey Couchman new video interview with Lawton biographer, Simon Callow, who talks a lot about, um, some of the stuff I was mentioning about, um, you know, how Mitchum, I'm sorry, how um, Lawton was in terms of coming to that point and wanting to direct. He's got a lot of background that I thought was interesting. Um, and then there is a clip from the Ed Sullivan Show in which cast members, it's uh, Peter Graves and Shelley Winters doing a scene in prison that isn't in the movie. So that's kind of neat. And more of that later. Um, and then a 15-minute archival documentary about the film featuring Robert Mitchum. Actually, that has the Lillian Gish interview and Stanley Cortez. And then they have an archival interview with Cortez that I want to say is about, you know, 10, 12 minutes. And he speaks specifically about some things, including that story about the music, which is great. Um, And also has a gallery of sketches from Davis Grubb, the author who, what's really interesting is when Mitch, I'm sorry, when Lawton found the novel or was given the novel and wanted to make the movie, he went and stayed with Davis Grubb for like five days And eventually something came where he told Lawton, I actually have, this is how I pictured this scene. And he actually drew pictures of certain scenes from the book that ended up almost being like storyboards that Lawton would then later use for the film. And so it's really neat to see some of the comparisons of that. Um, So this includes the drawings and Lawton loved it. He's like, send more pictures, you know? And I think in a way he was saying, I need all the help I can get. And he used it really well between, you know, setting up those shots with Stanley Cortez and just having the author's intent and idea in his head. I think it was smart. It's a smart way to go about it. But the really interesting thing on this is the second disc, which is it contains something called Charles Lawton directs the night of the hunter. And it's a two and a half hour treasure trove of outtakes and behind the scenes footage um, from Robert Gitt. And he and a couple other people put together, apparently Lawton had had or somebody that knew him had had all this outtake footage and he's able to put together this really interesting documentary. It functions as a documentary because he he bridges the gap between the scenes with still shots of actors and does a little, you know, this is what this person was doing or this is what they were known for and then goes into some great scenes and you get to see Lawton or hear him directing the children. Uh, directing Mitchum. You get to see a scene where Mitchum actually is kind of directing the children. There's actually a scene that he has with the kids where he's sort of directing or co-directing with them and helping them through a scene. It's amazing. It's really great. So you also get to see scenes that aren't in the movie. It's really something incredible. And then there's an interview with Leonard Malton and uh, Git for about 15 minutes where he talks about this project and how it came together. But that's priceless stuff. And, and again, these are not included on this 4K, unfortunately. But, you know, these two discs together really make uh, a great combination of wonderful visual presentation with some new extras 
and a, a nice new commentary from Tim Lucas, and then a whole bunch of other great stuff on this Criterion Blu-ray. So overall, I definitely give this a high recommend uh, if you're a fan because it's the best the film has looked, and you really need to have it that way if, if you're one of those people that loves this movie as much as I do. Um, so hats off to Kino for doing a nice job with the presentation. But definitely pick up the Criterion Blu-ray as well, if you, or don't sell it if you already have it. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.